My father was, uh, his background because of sometimes you inherit your, your parents' trade and my grandfather, he came from a, a farming up in San Luis Potosí. Uh -huh. and, uh, they owned a... In Mexico, in yeah? In Mexico, mm -hmm. San Luis Potosí, Mexico. They owned, uh, his family, his parents owned land. Oh yeah? A big, Is there a crosswalk we need to go to or? Yeah, we're gonna cross All right. right now. Okay. Oh my gosh. They tore down all this. What was there before? It's part of the mansion of uh, oh. Mr. Hughes. Oh. Mr. Merrick. There's two millionaires, Mr. Merrick and Mr. Hughes. Mr. Hughes was king of the orchards. Uh, uh, what kind of camellias, oh, orchids? Camellias. 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 And he lives around this street here, on Green Street. Uh huh. Somewhere in this area. And now it's so we uh. We gotta go over here. This was sort of like Lovers Lane. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. In high school, when you were in high school age or younger. Yeah, way up in the till 53. Or... Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My name is Maxine Garcia. And what? When were you born? I was born August the seventh, nineteen thirty-five. And where were you born? I was born at the General Hospital in Los Angeles because uh, I was told at that time that was uh, the best hospital there was next to the Huntington. But even the Huntington, uh, for delivery, they used to have a a, a, what do they call, a clinic, a dispensary. That's what uh -huh. a women's hospital. That's uh -huh. what they call because my youngest sister, Bertha Terrell, Bertha Garcia Richards now, um, she was born there February 4th, 1944. Here, let's start with my father. He was born in Lamanda Park, that's East Pasadena, uh -huh. March 14th, 1907. Oh. Yeah, and uh, my grandfather came turn of the century after his parents died. To Pasadena? No, he first, my, I get this history from my, my father's last living sister. Mm -hmm. Her name is Jessie Garcia Medina. Mm -hmm. And she was born August the 7th, same day as me. She just turned 95. Wow. She was born in 1918. Happy birthday to both of you. Yes. And so she's the one, I started asking her questions when we were young kids. We never, we never bothered to ask our parents, and my father died at the age of 70. Oh. So I started asking her. I was very close to her because uh, she, I knew, you, you know, when you're a child, you can tell who loves you. Yeah. And she gave me a lot of love, mm -hmm. and, and uh, she treated me very well. And my brother, I'm the oldest of the Garcias, which is Albert. My brother Albert follows me, and he's born in April 13, 1938. My sister Luz Lidia Garcia was born October 7th, 1937. Mm -hmm. Would that make her older, younger? She's yeah, like, older uh, than your brother. No, she's one year younger. Oh, so, so nine thirty-nine. Wow. Okay, I may have been wrong. That's that's. I was I was wrong about uh, Green Street over there. Here's the street right here. Oh. It was Olcott Street. This little pathway here, it's Olcott. What it used to be Olcott Street. Oh. They've taken it away. And after I was born, my parents, their first home was at, um, I think it's 35 uh, West Peach, Peach Place. It's over there. It used to run off of uh, Fair Oaks or into Fair Oaks, a uh -huh. small little street. Mm -hmm. They now have condos and took the name from that. It just hurts me. It's right across from Central Park. Oh, so I yeah. was there till about the age of five. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm assuming five because my parents used to, my mother used to take us uh, to the Central Park. She used to take me and my brother. Mm -hmm. So at the age of four, she told me I was about four. Here, this is it right here. You know how I can tell? The wall there, see that wall? Oh yeah. Yeah, and there used to be some bushes there, or whatever. And we, we came up here one time during the Korean War. My my fiance or my boyfriend at that time, mm -hmm. he called me, and his friend had just come on a furlough. 
can you find a girlfriend or something? The girl he came to see in Pasadena had, had gone out. Oh my gosh, what a big change here. To your right is the area where my brother and my sister and I and two other friends that we grew up with, Rudy and Charles Marmolejo, mm -hmm. they, uh, their parents were grew up with my father. They were from East Pasadena. Uh -huh. And uh, they were best man and best woman, best maid of honor best woman, maid of honor. 40 years of age, I had a surgery at the hearing clinic. And uh, it, I, my experience was like Helen Keller. I, I heard all those loud sounds. Was it overwhelming to hear yes, him suddenly yes, like that? especially the water, because I was living in East Pasadena. Oh. And I had a home there on Valley View, and uh -huh. I had a pool. My husband, my second husband, Wardell, he grew up, a, he went, he was born in East L.A. Uh -huh. Grew up with all the Mexican people and his parents. Oh. Yeah, he was uh -huh. white, Anglo-Saxon, uh -huh. Wardell. Uh -huh. Actually, his legal name was Knight. Knight. Okay, and I, I'm looking over here. Oh, no, I have to be further down. I want to see about more or less where our, where our house was. Wow, it so this, when right was... in there, right in there. Right oh, in here? Where those trees are. Yeah? Yeah, that probably was a street. Oh and wow. We lived down that side. So this whole campus came along much later. Oh way. Yeah. Later. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Mr. Merrick, he started buying the, the homes there. Uh, he bought them for about four thousand dollars. Oh my Gee, goodness. Yes, cheap. Yeah. He he could see the future. He had a, and the last person that sold their home that were homeowners now was their Cervantes. Paula, you call it Paula. Paula and her husband Fred. They were already age 75 or something. So and they held out, huh? And, well, like when they approached her, well, this is what she told me. They wanted to buy a mountain. She said, and where are we gonna go? She said, we're old already and my husband doesn't work. We don't have any uh, income. Yeah. And uh, I don't know about anything about Social Security then, even if they got it then, but anyway. Yeah. She says, we don't have any income, so forth. So they said, so we're, we're not selling, you know. They must have gotten, because the oldest, Alex, who never married, he was a notary, he was a registered notary republic, mm -hmm. or notary what? Notary republic, yeah. Yeah. And he must, he must, I assume he must have looked, because uh, they finally got an offer of 18000 Oh my goodness. And so everybody else got bought out at four? Yeah. Oh but my that, goodness. They, they were there they were the last house there on that Wow. Time. Right over in yeah, there? Yeah, right. See where those trees are? Yeah. I yeah. think those were the probably the street and we lived right yeah, we lived right in here. Wow. You know? So uh, they bought a home up in Altadena on Calabasas off of uh, Fair Oaks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always kept in touch with them. Anyway, the story goes like this. I kept in touch with them because growing up, they were like our relatives. They were The neighbors were neighbors. If you needed an onion, flour, salt, anything, they were there to give it to you and vice versa. And her husband was such a control freak. <laughs> she didn't have any other friends but my mother, and she was much older than my mother. So whenever she had a chance, she came over to be with my mom. Mm -hmm. One time my mother offered her a, a drink, like a champagne glass. Well, I had a picture of that. Her kids couldn't believe it, but <laughs> I used to be over her house all the time. And the reason was her husband used to buy comic books every week, about four of them. So that was the thing. I was about 12. So that's 35, 45, 47, or 45. I used to go over there and sit in the front room and read them all. Mm -hmm. And I'd be there so long reading them that pretty soon she had uh, Fred, Louie, and they used to come from work, from doing asphalt work. That's mm -hmm. heavy, hot, that hard That is work. hard, yeah. Yeah, and they used to come home. So what I remember of her, she always had a real nice meal for them. 
they used to make homemade tortillas, her and her two, two daughters, Rachel and uh, Rachel and Dora. Now they were my sister's friend. Dora was my sister's age born. She was born 1929, so there. They were growing up together, went to school together. I have her picture in the, at home. In any case, um, I used to notice that how they had a, the whole family sat in the table and they ate as a family. They didn't do too much talking, but um, the, in the kitchen was very small. Uh, Rachel, I think, and the mother would make the tortillas and Dora would uh, cook them, you know, so you had about four tortillas cooking and they'd be there eating. I was always wishing they'd ask me to eat, you know? <laughs> but after a while, I said, you know, you, you know, I better get going, <laughs> you know, because now it's, you know, I'm interfering, you know. So I would leave. Do you know that when they sold the house, they all regretted. The man had, they had uh, about three bedrooms upstairs. The girls had one bedroom, Dora and Rachel together. They had an older sister, but she married early. Mm -hmm. And they had, the, anyway, the middle room was a smaller room, and he had it packed thousands of comic books. So when they sold the house, they left them behind and they got tossed away. They're, they're very valuable. They're yeah. collector's items. Wow. You know. But uh, I also, so I used to be at their house a lot and uh, I was there when Dora had her first epileptic fit. She fell down the stairs. She went, I was behind her and she tumbled down. Oh my goodness. And she hit the sewing machine and uh, her mother got all excited and everything and so uh, I think she told me to call my mother because she couldn't drive. Another thing that uh, they did, uh, uh, Paula did, Paula, the houseman used to come by our street, they did, they'd always stop every day, stop at her house. See she had the workers, she had the, I guess, in, in their time, my mother's time, in her time, mostly her time, men worked and women stayed home and uh, took care of the house, the babies, the dinner, they ran the home. So she used to buy fresh pastry every day for the family, you know? And uh, they got along very well. However, my father did not like him. Mr. Cervantes? Yeah, uh -huh, Fred Cervantes, because we were two houses over from them. The reason is that we had a bathroom that faced the next door, which was my aunt's house. Mm -hmm. One time, it was a small bathroom, just the tub, the toilet, and the basin. Mm -hmm. When I got up, there I see his face. Oh my goodness. And I, you know, I was my dad's first Firstborn, I'm his well, love child. Oh, I guess he doesn't like that. I, I'm his love child. I don't, don't, they, mm -hmm, everybody no. knew. Don't mess with Maxine because she's going to tell her daddy. Oh my goodness, what happened? <laughs> well, I told my father. Mm -hmm. He had words with him, and anytime he saw him near our house, he'd throw rocks at him. <laughs> the relationship was with uh, their children and my, my sister, uh, my half sister, my oldest sister, Marina Rodriguez. Uh huh and their mother mm -hmm. but not her their mother <laughs> was an angel their mother was an angel she was she was just so good anything for for us uh -huh. my mother needs a potato she needs uh, some sugar she needs well, mostly potato or something she always always furnish it with us one time i had an emergency two emergencies my mother had gone to tijuana I was over there for a month fixing my grandmother's papers to, she was fixing her papers to cross over the border. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had been here, guess turn of the century, and she had worked here and so forth. Remember I told you 1941 mm -hmm. she went back? Mm -hmm. So in fixing her papers, she had to have proof of who knew her back then and, you know, for documentary purposes. So my m mother got all this paperwork done and uh, gathered it together and, and so she was away and then my sister Bertha the youngest one born in 1944 
She was about just 12, maybe mm -hmm. 11. She was a big girl because she uh, matured very quickly. And uh, so my dad, I was working with my dad and taking care of the family. So then my dad tells me, go see what's wrong with your sister. And then she's crying and she's bending over. She has a pain in her abdomen. <gasps> oh. So I said, I didn't know what to do. I was, if she's uh, 11, I'm, I'm already 20. I'm ten, almost 10 years, nine and a half years older than her. And so I had to be, I wasn't married. I was there with the, my dad and the family. Mm -hmm. So I ran over to Paula and I tell her what's, what's going on. And she said, get a hot water bottle. Put a hot water, that's the worst thing you can do for a tennis. Oh my goodness. So when I got back, my dad had decided to take her to the general hospital. Uh huh. So off we went to the general hospital. Good thing we didn't put the hot water bottle. And, uh, well, it was the appendix. Oh my goodness. And they did surgery on her. They examined her and then they discovered <gasps> she was in puberty already, you know, at nine and a half. Oh my goodness. And uh, so. Oh my goodness, that's Yeah, young. they're talking to me. I go, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and because I was a teenager then, you know, I was 19, 20, and so anyway, they said, well, she's such a grown big girl. We hate to put her with the children's department, but we're going to have to. So she had her surgery while my mother was away, and so I always had to play mother for her. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother gave her to me when I was eight and a half, and that was my first responsibility. I didn't have a childhood, yet, you know, and that's okay because I loved her, you know, growing up, and and uh, I accepted helping my parents. My dad had no one but but me. My mother couldn't do anything with my older sister. She just spoiled her, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, well, all she could do was wash dishes I distinctly remember when I was 10 years old she put the apron around me she said well I think you're old enough to take over and start washing dishes from now on that's your job or were there plenty of dishes well, I guess so huh uh -huh. and uh, that's how it went so then I tried to teach my of course the boys didn't do that he was the outside, we didn't have grass, we had dirt in my bed, but his responsibility was to wet it down so it could be hard. Mm -hmm. And when he didn't do it, boy, my dad would swat him. My dad had this philosophy of don't hit a child in the body, in the head. Get a strap and hit him on the butt. Uh huh. <laughs> Get him on the buttocks. Yeah. Our, our pastor talked about child abuse. Uh huh. I gotta tell him. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, his their opinion about this child abuse because he brought a counselor from La Crescenta High School. Uh huh. And she talks about how her husband got a strap, an inch, an inch. She go, she went like this, an inch, <laughs> and he was getting ready to spank their daughter. And she intervened and she said, no, you are not going to do that. And that was when she made a decision to leave her husband. Oh my goodness. So today in the 21st century here, they're calling it abuse. But I tell you what, if my dad hadn't whipped the tar, especially out of my, my brother, he, he would get the three of us and we take us one at a time. He never asked my mother, what did they do? He never questioned. He'd get home and my mother would tell him they didn't behave, they did this and this and that. And that was good enough for him. And he'd have a strap. And then he hit us on our butt. My younger sister, because she was so white and more fragile, I call her fragile, Timmy. I, I told her, she started laughing when I told her, yeah, you were crying, bloody tears. Betty, daddy, please, daddy, please, don't you spank me, you know. You give it to her, not spank her, <laughs> so she would get the spanking. But if my dad hadn't spanked my brother, he did many 
things wrong. He's, when we went up north to San Jose one time on a Sunday, he stole the farmer's truck. Oh my goodness! He took the farmer's truck and he knew how to drive already at 13, but he put it because a stick shift is mm -hmm. down here is mm -hmm. first, but in a truck it's reverse. <gasps> so he put it in reverse thinking it's first and he backed up and he hit the gas tank. Oh my goodness! So the gas station guy called the oh my goodness. Police, police in San Jose. I used to say, how did they find us? We were out like in the wilderness to me, you know? Yeah. But they got a hold of my dad and my dad the next day, woo! He was, he was working side by side with my dad. What were you, you guys were picking, what did you say, picking? We picked prunes for, uh, let's see, I was 10, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I was uh, for five years. And then somebody from Pasadena told my dad about uh, the walnuts. See me, more park, see me, where nothing but fields and fields of ranchers having walnuts. Oh. All walnuts. See me was nothing but. Hmm. Nothing but nuts. Nothing but nuts. <laughs> and so, he said, let's try it over there. We liked it better because see how in the shade you pick mm -hmm. all the walnuts? Yeah. And sometimes you'd make a pile and just sit there and we could talk and you know how yeah. you yeah. you know work fast when you're young yeah. or if you picked them uh, with a with a with a shell mm -hmm. you can just put them in the sack but yeah. they were a big sack. Well, yeah, how and much did those things weigh? How many were how much did you pick a day? Well that's why I have a deteriorated spine. Oh. My my sister, my sister that follows me, she's uh seven, she's going on seventy five in October. She said, that comes with old age, she's, we, we talked, she's, mm -hmm. she's my only sister, I, that's what I, I say. And I said, old age, my foot. <laughs> I said, it's coming from working hard for 10 years. Yeah, in your the, early teens. The walnuts, we worked from 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, till oh. the moon came out. Oh my goodness, that's hard we, work. We had a, a goal, my dad. How many boxes make a ton? 40 boxes <gasps> make a ton. Oh my God. We had to pick three tons when it was a second. You pick prunes three, the first time, the second time, and the third time. Then the, you have to shake the tree. My dad used to have to shake the tree. Well, as they get ripe, ripen, they, they more come down each time. So by the second and third, you could pick three tons of boxes. In one day? My dad was very good in math. Uh -huh. And he used to keep a book, and he was teaching me math all the time. He showed me, look, this is what, write the day, the date, and in every, you know, every 10, make a marking, mm -hmm. every 5, 10, you know. And then get, when we get to, let's see, 40, 80, 120, I remember one time when we did 180 boxes. I remember distinctly because wow. he was pretty happy and he showed me. Wow. He used to share this. My brother, he can care less. <laughs> and my sister, lesser. <laughs> but um, you see, my the boys that my brother grew up with, and you know, when they become teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, the boy stuff, they started stealing. Then they went into marijuana, to, to drugs. And at that, in the 50s, if they, the police caught you with a, they call a joint, mm -hmm. cigarette, they would send you to camp. You'd go to jail. Wow. For one cigarette, or one yeah. joint. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, they're smoking out in public. <laughs> but anyway, all of them, all of them, three of them ended up in San Quentin. <laughs> and one of them, I don't know where he was, but they all ended up to no good. My brother became transformed and convicted at uh, 15, I think, 16, when Pastor Deretorio Venegas became pastor at the Latin America Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. He came from, I don't know, El Paso, I believe, but he came from a Catholic background, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and he became a Pentecostal type. He was a very... vibrant in his speech and he transformed he touched many lives wow when he was pastor we we multiplied into about 300 members at the wow. church wow and through his teaching 
he was telling the congregation, it's not up to the First Methodist Church on Colorado. They were our mother church. They would, they supported us. He said, it's not for them to support us. It's not them to pay the rent, the pastor, the light, the water. It is our responsibility. So start tithing. That's <laughs> what it was. The administration and my brother became accepted Christ and was transformed in his way of living. Uh, he got him a scholarship to go to Lydia Patterson Institute. It was a private school in El Paso that, it was the only one I think, that used to train um, Methodist ministers to become ministers, to go out in the field for ministry work, whether to be missionaries or to sponsor a church. And so my brother, I guess he had quit school because he finished school over there. But my brother went there, he got a good education, and he learned Spanish. I mean, my mother spoke, my mother was bilingual, so we, and we could understand it. But my brother told me personally that when he picked up the Bible in Spanish, that it was just more meaty to him, it ministered to him more, so he let the English Bible down and ministry. he started getting fed by the Spanish Bible. And they, during the summer, they would send them, the, he went to Michigan to 10,000 Lakes, they sent him like the apostles by twos out to the field to the men. He went to prisons, he, and so forth. He wasn't afraid to go anywhere. Wow. He became a, a teacher and a preacher. Wow. <laughs> yes, but if my father, Hannah, like nowadays you'd say, oh, that's abuse or something. If my dad hadn't beat the tar out of him, he would have ended up in sand printing and, and wasted. Oh yeah, uh, some of his, the kids he came up with. Yes. Yeah. And, and they, they had a father, but you know, he went to World War II and he came back a mess. And, yeah. And when he would drink, he would be abusive to his wife and he would see, uh, the kids would see how he would hit his, his, his their mother. Uh -huh. And they lived down the end of the block from where we did. Uh -huh. They lived on Vernon. And Alice grew up, was, well, she was my dad's friend too. She would tell the oldest boy, go get Mata. The, the, the Spanish people would call my dad Mata, M-A-T-O, M-A-T-A, which means kill, killer. <laughs> or, uh, and the American from uh, the, the Americans, uh, Saxon people, mm -hmm. people from the Annandale Golf and others called him Maddie. Ah, for Mata, yeah. Uh -huh, for, his name was Matilde with a D-E. Doctors all got confused. His name was Matilde? Uh -huh. That was his first name? Yeah. You're fearless about crossing streets, Maxine. <laughs> Uh, well, you have to be you wise. Go up, just, yeah. You have to be wise, my gosh. <laughs> Don't go when the cars are going. No. <laughs>